Hi, I'm Brian Schultz from The Ohio State University, and in this lecture we're going to take a brief look at the history of the Japanese samurai warrior, going from their origins around the 12th century right up to their final year in 1877. To keep things interesting, we'll be using a slightly unusual approach by looking at the development of these warriors alongside the history of their weapons. So let's dive in. In the popular image of the samurai, nothing comes to mind sooner than his sword. In film and media portrayals, every samurai wields a blade. He fights with it on foot and from horseback, and his sword is equally at home in the busy streets of Kyoto and upon the open fields of the Kanto Plains. Yet, historical examination of Japanese weapons technology and associated tactics in the pre-modern period has found that most fighting was actually done at a distance. The samurai and his, his predecessors used the Japanese bow to great effect, and it was only the introduction and adoption of firearms that finally displaced the bow from its position as the most important weapon on the pre-modern Japanese battlefield. Dwarfed in importance by the bow for most of Japanese history, then, the sword nevertheless developed into a potent weapon. It had continuous innovations in shape, length, and characteristics that all reflected the nature of battle in each era. So rather than falsely picturing the sword as the symbol of the samurai or even as their primary weapon, it is better to understand the sword as a connecting link, one that links all eras of Japanese conflict from the sword's first introduction to Japan in ancient times right up until the end of the samurai class itself. The sword's continual evolution and its steadily growing importance and usefulness in urban battles thus reflected the rise of what would ultimately become the samurai class. In the same way, the Japanese warrior himself was a product of constant evolution, driven by changing social and political needs. In fact, there's really no one moment where we can really stop and say, ah, now this guy was the first real samurai. The term samurai itself, whose most basic meaning is simply one who serves, wasn't even originally associated with warriors in the Japanese language. It was only by the start of the Tokugawa era in the 17th century that a substantial number of these men that we call samurai would have even recognized themselves as being part of a class of people that could be referred to as samurai in Japan. Until then, they probably thought of themselves simply as bushi, a word literally meaning warrior gentleman, and that term actually remains the usual word ascribed to them in modern Japanese. So with that bit out of the way, let's now turn to a consideration of the earliest warriors and weapons in Japanese history. As we said before, the bow was the dominant weapon of ancient Japan. It replaced stone-tipped axes and spears around 10,000 BC. Taking advantage of Japan's abundant forest resources, early craftsmen made their bows from a select piece of wood that was cut directly from a tree trunk. By the end of the Stone Age, Japanese bowyers had already developed the laminated composite bow, which used lacquer and multiple layers of wood or bamboo to increase the bow's tensile strength and power. We see only minor modifications and improvements to the weapon for centuries thereafter. And that's about it for the bow's development in Japan. Its spectacularly brief technological history contrasts sharply with the expansive history of the Japanese sword. That history began in the Bronze and Iron Age, when traders from China and Korea brought new weapons to the Japanese islands. These included the first prototype swords, and by 100 AD, Japanese blacksmiths were forging their own. Early metal weapons were both rare and tremendously valuable, meaning that they quickly gained societal and ritual significance. They are regularly found buried with village chiefs and with other local leaders, and no doubt these swords served in important ceremonial and religious roles. Indeed, many of them are so fragile in their construction that they could not possibly have served as weapons. But coincident with the appearance of swords in Japan was the first evidence of organized battle. The introduction of agriculture had resulted in growing inequality, and poorer men soon organized to attempt to take their neighbor's surplus farm production by force. By 300 AD, the clan-based military states of Kofun-era Japan had formed and equipped armies, 
These armies wielded hunting bows as well as swords and spears crafted from both bronze and iron. The Japanese also began their first armed forays to the Asian continent, perhaps partly motivated by the search for additional resources outside of iron poor Japan. Around the year 400, Japanese soldiers ranging abroad in Korea faced the horse-mounted soldiers of the kingdom of Goguryeo for the first time. These Korean riders easily smashed the disorganized and footbound Japanese armies. And having experienced the power of cavalry firsthand, the surviving Japanese fighters quickly adopted the associated technology, namely the stirrup, and mounted warfare became the new standard of battle in Japan as well. So how did these early Japanese warriors actually fight? Tales from the Nihon Shoki, a mytho-history of Japan's origins, indicate that the use of bow and arrow from horseback was well-developed as a technique of warfare by the 6th century. Japanese cavalrymen also duplicated the Korean practice of using swords from horseback once the battle had turned to a melee, rather than dismounting and fighting on foot. Early Japanese swords were primitive by later standards. Excavated samples have generally ranged between 60 and 70 centimeters in length, though light, longer blades likely existed. For example, the Kojiki, related to the Nihon Shoki, it references swords of as much as 10 fists in length, which would have been between 90 and 100 centimeters. These blades were forged from a single unfolded piece of iron. Though by the late Kohun period, Japanese swordsmiths had developed a technique called differential tempering. This process hardened the edge of the blade to a greater, de to a greater degree than the back of the blade, and differential tempering thus increased sharpness while reducing the chance that the blade would shatter on impact. Coincident with this enhancement was the appearance of the first deliberate, deliberately curved swords. Adding a curve improved the slashing ability of the blade and made it ideal for cavalry fighting. From the 6th to 8th century, the collection of individual polities that made up Japan gradually came under the control of a single, well-defined central state. As part of this process, military organization was steadily refined as well. Royally appointed regional strongmen now served as mounted warriors. They wielded the bow and sword, and they commanded units made up of peasant foot soldiers using bows, swords, and spears. As only local chiefs could afford the expenses and time needed to learn equestrian warfare, these foot soldiers formed the bulk of the force. This mass army pattern was not distinctly Japanese. It was instead largely copied from the Chinese-style organization that had proven so effective against Japan's early raids on the continent. In 672, a civil war broke out in Japan over the imperial throne. Known as the Jinshin War, this conflict revealed that continental mass tactics had actually made little headway against traditional Japanese ways of fighting. Horsemen, not massed infantry, turned out to be the linchpin of every decisive battle, and victory ultimately went to the prince who had accumulated the broadest support from the families of local mounted warriors. This victorious prince became Emperor Tenmu in 673. Perhaps concerned about his reliance on the proto-warrior class, he intensified efforts to build a Chinese-style infantry force for Japan. His successors demonstrated the value of this new army by quelling a revolt in northern Kyushu in 740. Almost a century after the first decision to adopt Chinese tactics had been made in Japan, the first references to battle lines and infantry crossbowmen begin to appear in Japanese chronicles. Yet a second revolt in 764 would once again be put down largely by the strength of the local mounted strongmen, not by the Chinese-style state army. By the start of the Heian period in 794, efforts at Chinese-style military reform in Japan were quickly fading away, a professional warrior class had arisen among the provincial strongmen, and these men were now serving the court as dedicated providers of violence. As the perceived risk of an invasion from China diminished due to internal turmoil there, large infantry formations became increasingly less useful to Japan's elite. Continuous conscription was thus ended in 792. 
and it was replaced by the system of so-called strong fellows, or conde. These strong fellows were martial specialists drawn from among the horsemen and warlords that had led the old conscript armies. Each strong fellow was authorized two grooms to accompany him in battle, who then likely served as foot soldiers once things got started. This was an arrangement identical to what became the common configuration of samurai warriors by the 12th century. Strong fellows essentially bridged the gap between the end of the peasant army and the rise of what we think of as samurai power. Many of these men had distinguished bloodlines in spite of their rural backgrounds. They were often the second and third sons of noble families. Heian elites called upon them to quell uprisings, to put down bandits, and to manage the rural farmland of courtiers who were increasingly unwilling to leave the comforts of the capital to tend to their own land. As large-scale conflicts broke down into countryside skirmishing between small groups of strong fellows, the sword gained in importance. A horseman could only carry a limited number of arrows for his bow, as few as 24, and as you can imagine, it was quite difficult to strike a specific moving target from horseback with a bow. Being unable to strike a specific target wasn't ideal if you had a very specific rival that you wanted to kill. And in this period, his death, or yours for that matter, could well be the reason for the entire battle. In other words, the more individualized the combat, the greater the role of the sword. In the meantime, technological developments had continued to improve the lethality of the Japanese warrior. Blade profiles took on a new shape, known as shinogi zukuri, and they often incorporated a new shorter point called a kokisaki. This type of point was made for quick slashes at an enemy's throat, exactly the type of strike likely to present itself in mounted combat against other horsemen. The late Heian period also saw one of the most unique and significant metallurgical developments in Japanese sword making, the famous process of folding the steel as it is forged. Folding increases edge sharpness dramatically, while also increasing the resilience of the blade when it strikes a hard surface, such as a piece of armor or another sword. This innovation helped make up for the somewhat poor quality of Japanese iron, and thus made the sword a more reliable battlefield weapon. Reliable weapons were needed because by the early 10th century, the fragile central government of Japan was beginning to show its weakness. Growing political troubles compounded with economic hardship and population stagnation, providing fertile ground for defense, excuse me, dissent against the state. As rebellions became more frequent, the court became increasingly reliant on warrior protection of their farms and estates. Soon they began to award management rights for that land to the warriors as direct compensation for their service. Yet this development by itself doesn't explain how these warriors managed to seize political power in the late Heian era. That story begins with the Minamoto family, a group that would eventually become military overlords of all of Japan, but who were, for now, campaigning on the court's behalf in the 11th century. They were on the march in the northern part of Honshu, Japan's main island, against the Abe family, a dissident group that had taken over the province of Mutsu and begun openly defying court authority. The leader of this punitive expedition and the head of the clan at the time, Minamoto no Yoriyoshi, was a figure of no small renown. Tales from the time make clear that the soldiers who marched on this campaign did so out of a sense of personal loyalty to Yoriyoshi himself, not out of loyalty to the distant court. Of course, loyalty was not enough to sustain an enduring relationship on its own. Warriors expected tangible rewards for their service, rewards they received in the form of shares of the estates that their leaders, men like Yoriyoshi, now managed on behalf of the courtiers in Kyoto in exchange for their service. As a result, in the provincial areas of Japan, the path to political power and wealth became one that passed through service to a military leader who was capable of repaying his followers with land rights. Such bonds often transcended generations, as not just individual men, but entire families swore loyalty to their military leaders, 
and expected their sons to continue this lord and vassal relationship. By the mid-12th century, military figures had begun to rival court nobles in their importance in managing Japan's land. This development was accelerated by events in the capital. In 1156, a small number of warriors were called in to settle a dispute over succession to the throne. This incident, called the Hogan Disturbance, marks the point at which warriors truly ceased to be subordinate to the civilians who dominated the court, and that included the long untouchable Fujiwara family. Without going into too much detail, suffice it to say that this succession dispute had divided the Fujiwara elite that ruled Japan. The two sides of the split Fujiwara enlisted the aid of warriors from the preeminent Taida and Minamoto clans, marking the beginning of an enduring rivalry between those two groups. Open fighting between Taida and Minamoto in the capital ultimately resolved the succession dispute, but left lasting bitterness. This soon yielded a new conflict, this time between the Taida and Minamoto directly in 1159. The House of Taida had crushed the Minamoto by the winter of 1160, but only 20 years later, Minamoto fortunes revived, and before long, they obliterated the Taida as part of the famous Genpei War. The real losers in 1160, however, were the court nobles and the Fujiwara. They never regained the authority that they had lost as part of their turn to military intervention to settle a purely political matter. By the start of the Genpei War in 1180, virtually all aspects of the old mass infantry formation had been abandoned. Battle was now little more than an individualized display of masculine prowess with weaponry. Organized infantry were all but invisible. It was around this time that a cult of swordsmanship began to grow in popularity among the warriors, as each sought some advantage in one-on-one -on -one combat while emphasizing his own unique martial talents and techniques. It was then that loyalty also became a serious issue among Japanese warriors, because these warriors changed sides depending on who appeared to be the most likely victor. Although the size of forces used in battle during this time are not well established, groups generally seem to have been smaller than in previous conflicts ranging from a few hundred to a few thousand horsemen, plus their attendants. The era of individualized combat had begun, and that meant that loyalty and distinction were more important factors than ever before. The mounted warriors of this era had highly customized gear. Their armor had uniquely colored lacings and helmet patterns, which made leaders easy to spot and ensured that they could seek one another out for one-on-one -on -one combat. Heirloom swords, too, had become profligate by this period, at least according to the war tales, and there are countless examples of blades with supposedly magical powers wielded by the warriors of Taida and Minamoto. Interestingly, magical bows appear rarely, if ever. More common are ever-larger bows being drawn by ever-stronger warriors. Fabulous tales of single arrows piercing through multiple men are almost certainly fantasy, but such feats remained markers of martial talent, even as the valor of the sword grew. After achieving victory at the pivotal Battle of Dan no Ura in 1185, Minamoto no Yoritomo had at last annihilated his Taida opponents and ended the Genpei War. He stood for a moment virtually unchallenged as the leading warlord in Japan. Minamoto no Yoritomo's victory in the 1189 Northern Campaign against Minamoto no Yoshitsune, his younger brother, brought all of Japan south of Hokkaido under Yoritomo's sole political and military authority. Yoritomo thus stood for a moment unchallenged. Known for his political savvy, he used this victory to build a strong new governmental system centered around the warrior class. Yoritomo moved the imperial court to the sidelines, only after gaining its blessing in the form of the title of shogun. He set up a new headquarters in Kamakura that effectively became the political center of Japan. <laughs> 
The shogun was the warrior of warriors, the generalissimo of all Japan. And though the word itself was revived from an older term, it had never before commanded such power. In effect, by bestowing this title upon the Minamoto, the court traded its influence in government for a guarantee that they would continue to enjoy both their guaranteed incomes from land taxes, as well as their status as the cultural and social elite of Japan. This was perhaps a small price to pay for a return to stability, albeit under shogunal rule. That stability didn't last, however. Within a few years of the death of Minamoto no Yoritomo, the Minamoto clan had its power usurped internally by the influence of one of its former allies in the Genpei War, the Hojo clan. The Hojo were themselves descendants of the Taira, and they now used the position of imperial regent to dominate both the shogunate and the emperor. These internal conflicts surfaced just as Japan was about to face its greatest foreign military threat since Tang Chinese armies had loomed in Korea. The Mongol invasions of Japan in 1274 and again in 1281 yielded what was essentially a conflict between two styles of warfare, Japan's individual mounted warfare and Chinese mass infantry tactics. The Mongols used a highly organized system of banners, drums, and gongs to coordinate the attacks of their massed infantry, and it was all based on the commands of a leader who observed from an advantageous terrain position. Japanese cavalry, their mounts frequently frightened and turned by the drums and gongs, struggled to fight against this new foe. One Japanese warrior described his surprise, saying that, whereas we thought about reciting our pedigrees to one another and battling man to man in glory or defeat, as was the custom of Japanese armies, in this battle, the Mongols assembled at one point in a great force. It was only the interference of the so-called kamikaze winds that saved Japan's warriors from defeat, as a timely storm wrecked the Mongol ships and sent the few survivors limping back to the continent. In the wake of the Mongol retreat, the Kamakura shogunate struggled to adequately reward its warriors for their service. Even after successfully quelling an attempted overthrow of the shogunate by the emperor Go Daigo, the Kamakura regime nevertheless fell when Go Daigo's son secured the support of the Ashikaga and Nita warrior families against the Minamoto. With the remnants of Yoritomo's successors at last swept from power, the emperor presumed to reclaim control of Japan in 1333. However, by 1338, he too had been ousted, this time by the warriors of the Ashikaga clan, whose earlier betrayal of the Minamoto had in fact been instrumental in Emperor Go-Daigo's rise to power, however brief it was. Indeed, backstabbing was the nature of politics in this period of Japanese history, and the start of the Muromachi shogunate under the Ashikaga in 1333 marked the beginning of the end of effective centralized administration in Japan. The Kamakura and Muromachi periods saw the peak of sword-making skill, as well as the expanded use of these blades in combat. Records of battle in the Taiheiki, a chronicle recounting the fall of Kamakura, suggest that men were now being, quote, cut down by swords as often as they were, quote, shot down by arrows and the accounts of individual battle detailed many new styles of swordplay. Warriors reported using such skills as the breast-slicing stroke, the bamboo splitter, and the goblin-toppling smiling stroke. And the number of famous named swords continued to multiply as well. Improvements in armor also diminished the effectiveness of the bow during this period, as heavier forms of body armor could now defeat most arrows. Some warriors are recorded as having been struck by as many as 20 arrows before succumbing to their wounds, and good armor could easily stop tens of arrows if no lucky hits were made. Sword blows were more often fatal. The sharp tip of the sword could pierce armor and make vital strikes. 
A heavy sword could even shatter an enemy's helmet or his entire armor set altogether. In response to the increasingly frantic nature of battle, the speed of drawing was also increased in the mid-Muromachi period. And this increase was enabled by a new blade shape, the Uchigatana, which was curved near the point rather than at the hilt, and which was only around 60 centimeters in length. Uchigatana were worn with the blade facing upwards rather than downwards as with earlier styles. And this change allowed a warrior to draw his weapon and slash in a single rapid movement, which was a big advantage for hand-to-hand -hand combat. All of these technical changes reflected not only the growing use of the sword in battle, but also the increasing speed and violence of fighting. This was a consequence of the changing shape of the battlefield as Japan degraded from centralized warrior rule to political chaos. The central government of the Ashikaga shogunate began to collapse shortly after 1441, when the shogun Yoshinori was killed while visiting a leading military lord's mansion in Kyoto. The lord, fearing that Yoshinori would reduce his, power, his family's power and position, had the shogun assassinated. Yoshinori's successors lacked military ambition, and the devastating Onin War began in 1467 under the nose of Ashikaga Yoshimasa, who was far more interested in the arts than in military matters. The Ashikaga shogunate, divided and virtually powerless, became as meaningless as the imperial court, while territorial warrior lords known as daimyo, literally meaning big names, established their own defensible domains across Japan. The daimyo's domains broke civil, legal, and tax-based links with the capital, and Japan descended into the bloody Sengoku period, the age of warring states. The basic nature of battle remained unchanged for most of this period. Warriors continued the individual contests that had defined earlier ages. But it was not long before some daimyo began to seek an advantage over their rivals in combat. Foot soldiers, called ashigaru, supplemented the ranks of mounted warriors and now fought alongside them on the field of battle. The ashigaru added mass to Sengoku armies, allowing them to maintain sieges, to extend their range of operations, and develop new tactics to counter cavalry, such as the use of the pike, which is really just a very long spear. A new ranged weapon threatened to supplant the bow in this period as well. This was, of course, the firearm, introduced by the Portuguese to Japan in 1543 and quickly copied. A lowly ashigaru, equipped with a firearm and minimal training, could now potentially unseat and defeat even the most powerful mounted and armored warrior. By 1582, the daimyo Oda Nobunaga had conquered nearly a third of Sengoku, Japan, and he did so by making extensive and effective use of firearms against his opponents. At the Battle of Nagashino, his ranks of spearmen and dismounted samurai, armed with swords, combined with lines of firearm-equipped foot soldiers, held their ground against a full-scale charge of mounted warriors. Nobunaga's emphasis on the use of firearms continued under his successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who used them to subdue the remainder of the country. Under Hideyoshi, even the highest samurai warriors were now expected to be familiar with the use of the arquebus, an early firearm. While firearms had previously been left to footmen, when they were originally treated as an unprestigious and perhaps even dishonorable weapon, once uh, Hideyoshi came into power, that perception changed. Firearms decided the outcome of the Warring States period, and once Tokugawa Ieyasu came to power in 1603 and consolidated Hideyoshi's gains into a new shogunate, Japan once again entered into a relative state of peace, one that it remained in until the dawn of the modern era. The Tokugawa shogunate was the peak of samurai life and power. Freed from the demands of constant warfare and locked into their superior positions by an enduring class system, the fierce inveterate samurai warriors were now tasked with managing the governance and staffing the bureaucracy 
of Japan. Several hundred thousand samurai had been more or less permanently mobilized to fight the wars of the late 1500s, and they had drawn income from their family lands in the countryside while they were at war. When peace came, however, few of them returned to supervise their land directly. Most remained in the castle towns of their lords, who were now sworn to Tokugawa allegiance. Others moved to Edo, the new capital of the Tokugawa regime, where they enjoyed the rich culture and opportunity available in the city. Others were posted as officers in rural areas, where they served as land assessors, tax collectors, and keepers of order. Their family lands came to be controlled by the daimyo or by the shogun's administrators, who would collect the rice grown by the peasants, forward it to the daimyo's storehouse, handle its sale through merchants, and then pay each samurai an amount of money befitting his rank, called a stipend. The samurai steadily came to occupy the position of a hereditary bureaucratic elite that managed the administrative businesses of the shogun and the daimyo. Most put down the sword and picked up the brush, because literacy, not skill in battle, was now the key factor in promotion assessment. And with promotions came more wealth, and with wealth came access to the ever-growing pleasures of urban life. In the 1820s, the long peace of the Tokugawa shogunate was interrupted by the arrival of gunboats from Western countries carrying foreigners who sought to open Japan for trade. Uninterested in foreign contact, Japan's leaders demurred, but centuries of peace had left the country weak in comparison to these new potential enemies, the United States first among them. The shogunate was soon left with no choice but to begin open trade with many of the seafaring nations of the West. This act once again lit the fires of rebellion in Japan as old feuds against the Tokugawa line had not been forgotten even over the centuries of peace. When the shogunate refused to revere the emperor and expel the barbarians, those old feuds exploded into civil war. In 1868, warriors from the domains of Satsuma, Choshu, and Tosa rose against the Tokugawa order in the Boshin War. They overthrew the shogunate and restored the power of the imperial court as part of the famous Meiji Restoration. The shogunate had been utterly dismantled by 1869. Soon, however, the samurai responsible, responsible for this political upheaval realized that their own class and their old way of war had itself become obsolete, not to mention that continued payment of guaranteed stipends was a drain on their new and rapidly modernizing economy. After quickly instituting the creation of Western-style conscript armies armed with modern firearms, the samurai abolished their own status in 1877. The Satsuma Rebellion in that year was the last gasp of the old samurai ideal, and the few proud warriors who stood up to defend their old rank and status were swiftly crushed by the new conscript armies. On paper, then, the samurai were no more by 1877. Yet their real influence continued long after the official demise of the class. Former samurai leaders remained in positions of high influence and power in the new Japanese government, and the ideals of the old warriors suffused even the conscripts of the new Imperial Japanese Army and Imperial Japanese Navy those ideas remained influential until the destruction of those institutions at the end of the Second World War. Today, the samurai fill the same role in Japan as knights do in the imagination of the West. They are figures of fantasy and esteem, commonly shown in exaggerated depictions that emphasize their supposed loyalty and boundless martial prowess. But the real history of the samurai, as we've touched on here, was one deeply stained with wanton violence and bloodshed, driven by internecine squabbles between courtiers and, ultimately, cast aside by history just as soon as they ceased to be useful to the preservation of political power in Japan. <laughs>